Hi everybody, welcome back to English 112. This is for our class for Thursday, the 17th of February. And as you know, this is an unusual class because of its small size. Initially, I had a registration of three with only one student participating. Try to contact the other two students and I'm still trying and haven't received a response. However, lo and behold, we've had a late ad. So that means that with um, some good fortune, we will have at least two students who are active and participating. So what that means is that I will be slowing down a little bit for today's class to allow our new student to have the opportunity to catch up. And what I've been talking about thus far is trying to define what literature is and how to go about reading literature and ultimately how to write about literature. And if you can note the notes below, you can see that on page 1663, there was a section that I had assigned for you to read entitled Reading in the Writing Process, where it talks about not just note taking, which is called annotating, when you take notes in a text of things that appear to be important or of interest, but also writing journals, which is actually a component of this particular class, where what I'm asking you to do in our first unit, which is the short story unit, to select three of the short stories we would have read and discussed and to write approximately a page or so in response to each of those short stories. Though you can write as much or as little as you like and certainly you can incorporate uh, information from the class videos or from the class discussion forum as well as your own thoughts and ideas. Doing more than just detailing plot, not what's happening, but why those things are happening. And you can see that on page 1665, it talks about how keeping a journal can be very useful in your reading by writing down your reactions to characters, images, language, actions, and other matters in a reading journal. You can often determine why you like or dislike a work or feel sympathetic or antagonistic to an author or discover paths into a work that might have eluded you if you hadn't preserved your impressions. And your journal notes and your annotations can take whatever form you find useful. Um, full sentences and grammatical correctness are not essential. So basically, you could do a bullet list if you so wanted to, um, unless your instructor is requiring something else, and I'm not. Um, you might make better sense of your reflections, however, if you were to put them in some sort of a format that resembles sentences and paragraphs, but that's up to you because eventually we will have a formal writing assignment where you will be writing an academic paper, approximately four to five pages based on one of the short stories we would have read. And it is possible that what you examine in the journals can eventually be turned into a paper. Not that that's necessarily required, but I know that oftentimes some of the work that you put into a journal is a good springboard for doing some further analysis for writing a paper. But again, they don't necessarily have to have a connection. And that section of readings that I had assigned also talks about writing a paper, about how ultimately you need to choose a topic and I'll be talking about this over the course of this semester. You are free to create your own topic as long as you have it approved by me, though I will also supply topics. So you can begin thinking now as we are reading the literature. And developing a thesis, a central idea that reasonable people could disagree about that ultimately you need to support with evidence from the text. You're almost like a courtroom attorney and a good courtroom attorney can basically argue either position. It's the same evidence, but they pick and choose which pieces of evidence to use to present to the judge. So in your, in your situation, it's similar in the sense that you should be able to argue multiple positions. The question is, which position do you want to argue? Because it's something that reasonable people could disagree about. And then you need to gather the textual evidence in order to support your position as a possibility. But again, we'll talk a little bit more about that as the semester continues. And there are a series of questions that are included in the text that you could consider put in the back of your mind as you are thinking about analyzing literature. And if you'll remember last class, we talked about some of the different schools for analyzing literature. One is entitled the formalist method, where you're thinking about things like character and point of view and tone and diction and imagery. 
So point of view, who is telling the cat, uh, the story, um, the tone, is it humorous or is it sad? The diction, the use of language that's used, the images and the symbols. Symbols are representational where something represents something else. And, and th these are, are usually good ways to proceed with any piece of literature. You can also ask yourself some biographical questions. How do um, pieces of information about the author's life help your understanding of the piece? Or psychological questions. How does the author's psychology or the character's psychology or even your psychology as a reader influence the particular piece? Or historical questions. How does the time period in which the story was written and which it was set, and they, it need not necessarily be one and the same, though it usually is, how does that influence the story? Or Marxist questions. If you are studying economics, you're probably studying Marx. Just like if you are studying psychology, you're probably studying Freud. And there's a, a good amount of interdisciplinary areas in terms of the possibilities of studying literature. So you could declare yourself not just a psychological critic, but a Freudian. And that means you're using Freud's theories in order to analyze the text. Or if you are a Marxist, or a theorist, then you would be using Marx's economic theories about social inequality and economic inequality in order to be able to support your particular position in a particular text. Or what you can do outside of looking at socioeconomic issues is think about new historicist questions. This wouldn't necessarily be talking about the historical period, but this would be talking about the cultural and the social values of the time. Or perhaps you could ask yourself gender studies questions where you are focusing on something like a particular gender portrayal in a text. If you declared yourself a feminist critic, then you would be focusing specifically on the portrayal of female. If you are asking yourself mythological questions and you are probably asking yourself, are there kind of archetypes or universal symbols or ideas that are used like, like quests or initiations or scapegoats? Um, or is there some sort of a kind of transformation that seems to be um, very archetypical? And I, I think we talked about how there are certain myths that are universal across cultures, such as the resurrection myth, um, that you certainly see in different details, but all cultures share the idea of renewal and rebirth. It's part of their storytelling. Or reader response questions. Um, the idea of how do we as readers, as a group, respond to a particular text. And again, we need to have textual evidence in order to be able to support that. And deconstructionist questions, are there contradictory meanings in the text? And what does that do to eliminate or increase meaning within the particular text? And then it even talks about how to organize a paper. So keep these pages in mind when you're actually writing a paper, um, that you need to find a topic that's a general idea. And then you need to develop a thesis, a specific statement that reasonable people could disagree about. And then you need to develop your thesis and organize your paper. You need to have things like an introduction and a conclusion where you introduce your, your subject, including the title and the author and your thesis. And you need to have a conclusion, which is a closing paragraph that sort of ties up loose ends and gives a sense of closure. And then you would have body paragraphs that also include things such as quotations. So that would be part of your evidence. And there are ways to go about documenting that, which we will discuss. And hopefully you begin your writing early so that you can revise and edit rather than trying to write everything at the last moment. And some of the questions that you're asked for revision, is your topic manageable? Is the thesis clear? Is the paper logically organized? Is your argument persuasive? Should anything be deleted because it's not related? Does the opening paragraph introduce your topic? And are the paragraphs developed and unified and coherent? Are there transitions between ideas and paragraphs? Do you have a concluding paragraph that gives a sense of closure? Is the tone appropriate for an academic paper? And remember, academic writing is very similar to the writing of business. Is the title engaging and interesting and unique? Again, that suggests that, more than suggests, you need to have a title. 
Um, have technical terms been used correctly? Remember, I drew your attention to a glossary at the back of your textbook that you could always utilize. But of course, there are other resources as well. Um, are you quoting efficiently and effectively? Have you followed your instructor's guidelines for manuscripts? And have you carefully proofread the final draft? So those are just some things to keep in the back of your mind as we continue to examine literature because eventually you'll be doing some formal writing as well as some informal writing. But for us, we were still in the place of trying to determine what formulaic literature is as opposed to the kind of literature that usually is worth our time for academic study. And we talked about how formulaic literature is just that formulaic and that it oftentimes is very trite and very predictable. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but it probably doesn't require a lot of thought or a lot of discussion or my layperson's definition of what makes a piece of literature. Can it be reread and generate new meaning and new ideas? And I, I don't think we really saw that with the first text that I had suggested that we examine, A Secret Sorrow. Although some individuals, uh, feminist critics in particular, have read things such as Harlequin romances to try to examine how female is portrayed in society so that could be an academic analysis, but there really isn't much there in terms of a literary analysis in the way that you would probably find in A Sorrowful Woman, which was the text that I used as a contrast. And I had suggested that there are certain elements you want to look at, such as the name of the author, and the date at which it was published, and the title. So we know the author is Gail Godwin. She's female. We're given a small bio about her. The text was published in 1971, so thinking about what life was like in 1971, specifically the focus on the women's rights movement, which is going to be important in terms of understanding this particular text. The title, and I had suggested that thinking about and or anticipating why an author might have chosen a particular title, though it may not be clear to you until you ultimately read the text, and then you need to reread the text. And I had suggested three readings, the first for plot, the second for analysis, and the third to refresh your memory. So when we have A Sorrowful Woman, I would suggest that something as simple as A, the um, article A as opposed to the article the will be quite important because the usually references something specific. A is much more general, one of many. And I would say a sorrowful woman suggests one of many sorrowful woman, women. When we read the story, we find out that there's a woman who is unhappy in her marriage. And that said, note that none of the characters are given names. And I think that's quite important because that tends to universalize the characters. They aren't seen as individuals. They are basically seen by their roles. So she's seen as wife and mother, which probably explains that opening line. Once upon a time, there was a wife and mother one too many times. And if we think about once upon a time, that's usually the term that's used to begin a fairy tale. And we know that fairy tales are supposed to end happily ever after. The story does not end happily ever after. So basically, the one too many times is a little bit of foreshadowing for us about this negative tone of what could be happening in this story. But again, we have to read this particular story. Think about Faye and Kai, how they very much represent the fairy tale ideal. And the story begins on a winter evening. So already that's establishing the mood and the tone. Times of day oftentimes represent emotional states or times in one's life. Morning being birth or hope, renewal. Um, afternoon being adulthood. And then evening, the beginning of descent. And then finally, nighttime, death. And... The same can be said of the seasons, where winter is oftentimes seen as descent, spring, renewal, summer, the height of life, and then ultimately autumn, the beginning of descent. So a winter evening already is quite negative. And again, we aren't given names for any of the characters. We're supposed to focus on the woman, hence the title, A Sorrowful Woman. But we also have very interesting stories that are not told about the spouse, a sorrowful man. I've often wondered 
how a sorrowful husband or a sorrowful man would read if we were given the story from his perspective, um, which goes to show how point of view is so important in a story. Or perhaps even more importantly, if we were given the story from the child's perspective, a sorrowful child, I think we'd get a very different perspective. And throughout the text, we're told that the husband understands the woman and the reality is that he doesn't, not through any fault of his own. Again, we have to think about the time period. He certainly doesn't have any ill intent towards her. He's trying to assist her, but he's unable to do so in an effective way. And we even have some modern terminology for this. He's enabling her behavior. She's uh, dissatisfied in her marriage and in her role as being a wife and mother. There isn't any particular reason why she should be dissatisfied. Um, and that's the crux of this piece. It isn't as if illness is, has overtaken this family or poverty has overtaken this family or domestic abuse has overtaken this family. Um, they, they seem to be quite comfortable and they seem to care about one another. The problem is that she just doesn't feel fulfilled. And that gets back to what life would have been like for female, especially in the 1970s, when there was a transition going on between the traditional roles of wife and mother for female and the um, attempt to broaden that beyond wife and mother that individuals, perhaps um, men and husbands as well, but especially women, needed to find a, a certain sense of self-actualization and, and meaning and purpose beyond those roles. And this is something that the woman in the story is unable to articulate, again, because these are the early days of the women's rights movement. So in some ways, we can't blame the husband because the wife can't even necessarily understand or articulate what's happening. Um, but we do know that when he says he understands her, he doesn't. And note that at the very beginning, we're introduced to some subtle clues, again, that help to set the tone, such as the child's eyes. The color happens to be gray. The husband's shirt also is gray. Gray is usually seen as a negative rather than a positive. We can also see gray as kind of an in-between place, not black or white, which would be the extremes, but someplace in the middle. And again, you can say that the story can be read that way. We don't really have heroes or villains. We just have some flawed people who are trying the best that they can in a system, a societal system that, that doesn't allow at least this wife and mother to do more beyond being a wife and mother. And even a small detail such as the husband undressing her early on and if we were reading a harlequin romance that would be the beginning of an erotic episode but that's not the case at all in this particular piece and we're told how her bra is hanging and think about some of the symbolism associated with bra and not in, from a sexual perspective but that bras are restrictive and constrictive um, and one might say that is applicable to the role that she's experiencing in society as wife and mother restrictive um, they also offer support and one might say that that's what she's looking for support um, and the idea that she seeks instant sleep a good amount of foreshadowing because ultimately by the time we get to the ending of the story we find out that she has committed suicide through drinking the sleeping uh, draft that her husband has been making her and if this is a surprise to you it's because this is subtly indicated it's never directly stated which goes to show that you have to read very very carefully we know that the husband has been making her some sleeping potion we know that he has been increasing the dosage so that he's now making them a week at a time or a week's dosage at a time we know that she's been storing it in the cupboard and we're told at the ending of the story that she went to the cupboard and she took what was hers, which means that she takes the sleeping potion. And we know that at the ending of the story, when the husband and son discover her, the, the, the boy, not really understanding what's happening, says that mommy's sleeping. Yet he still seems to have a good amount of insight, whether he realizes it or not, when he says she's tired from doing all of our things again which basically shows the idea of the overwhelming nature of wife and mother as caretaker for others rather than caretaker for oneself. And the husband, as he uh, pulls back her eyelids, where he's, he's looking for pupil dilation, where he um, 
puts his fingers on her wrists where he's looking for a pulse, where he puts his ear on her chest, he's searching for a heartbeat, is basically looking for signs of life. And when he buries his head in her hair, it's because he's distraught and grieving. So if you didn't catch that, then you definitely need to reread because if you haven't gotten the plot yet, then it's going to be hard to understand the analysis. The child is oftentimes described negatively um, as a vicious tiger at one point. Um, and you can think about tigers as being very predatory. Scratching even his mother's wrists at one point and think about how that might serve, serve as foreshadowing or a clue of what we are going to find later in the story because slashing one's wrists is oftentimes a means of suicide and this woman commits suicide at the end because being a wife and mother was just too much for her. Um, it kills her, literally and figuratively. And this hitting the child when the father would see is a cry for help in many respects. But again, she doesn't know how to articulate that help. Notice how secluded and isolated this family is. They basically are alone outside of hiring a girl to help them at one point. And most of the story takes place within the home. Again, very much less than a refuge and more like a prison for in this particular instance. And the husband, trying to help his wife, suggests that they do hire someone to help with the household chores and caretaking and child rearing. And they find the perfect girl who's uh, young and dynamic, but not pretty because the girl shouldn't be a physical or sexual threat. Um, however, the girl is indeed a threat because the girl is able to efficiently and effectively and happily um, um, engage in the roles of wife and mother. Um, so the wife and mother, the sorrowful woman, becomes so intimidated by the girl that she has the girl fired. Um, and then takes over the girl's white room. White can be very symbolic from either a positive perspective, a, a virginal innocence insight, or from a negative in, uh, perspective. It can be seen as very institutional, very boring. And I think both would be applicable for this particular story because the woman begins to achieve a certain le level of insight and tries to engage in a certain level of rebirth, but unfortunately she's unsuccessful. She spends her winter afternoons. Now notice at this point, we're moving forward in time. We started in the winter evening and by the middle of the story, we're in the winter afternoon, which would make us assume that perhaps there is going to be some sort of rebirth or renewal for the woman. She's wearing an old sweater she had worn in school, basically a time when she didn't have responsibilities for others, just responsibilities for herself. And as the woman takes over the white room, she's engaging in a lot of activities that are related to self-care. For instance, hair brushing, focusing on herself rather than someone else. There also are connections with hair brushing and fairy tales, think of Rapunzel, if you will. She also spends time writing sonnets, so she's engaged in creative writing. And in fact, she spends a good amount of time contemplating, does she have to write a sonnet which has very strict rules or can she write another kind of poem that doesn't have any rules? It doesn't even have to rhyme. And I, I think that's a great metaphor for her life as well, is that her life is very much like a sonnet with strict rules of what it means to be a wife and a mother. And what she's doing as she isolates herself from her family, and breaks away from the expectations of society, is contemplating the idea that she doesn't have to follow the rules. And of course, the isolation is stark, where she gets to the point where she will only accept notes underneath the door from her family, which might seem to be very unrealistic. Um, when we get to Emily Dickinson, though, we will talk about how this poet led a life that was in some ways somewhat similar. And I, I can't help but think of modern day parallels where family members are texting one another, even though they're in the same home. Um, but nevertheless, eventually, we move into spring and that usually means renewal and rebirth. So as readers, what the author is anticipating is that we are going to expect that there's going to be some sort of epiphany for this sorrowful woman, that she's going to achieve a renewal or a rebirth. Um, it may not necessarily be in the best interests of the family, which is how this tale is complicated. And we don't necessarily have to like or even support the sorrowful woman. We just need to identify with her position and what statement the author is trying to make to us as reader. Because certainly you can say that the sorrowful woman has responsibilities to her husband that she is ignoring. 
or if nothing else, she has responsibilities to her son, which she ignores and completely abandons when she commits suicide. So we aren't supposed to be completely sympathetic towards her actions. But again, we aren't supposed to be completely critical either because no one has ill intent in this particular position. And she's just trying to find a way to have a sense of individuality and independence in a societal structure that does not allow that for female. Again, the world was very different in 1971. Um, it, the idea of, well, I'll just get a divorce and then educate myself and get a job, much less likely to happen during that time period. But it was because of that time period that we have the changes we have now. And I've always suspected that's one of the reasons why the author wrote this piece with such a negative ending. We're not supposed to embrace the ending. We're supposed to rail against it and say, no, we don't want this character to commit suicide. What, what kind of world do we live in where this character feels this is the only option that's available? And the idea is that we as readers should do something about our societal expectations so that other women in this kind of position have other options. And I, I think that's indeed what we did. So I would say that literature oftentimes helps to instigate social change in our society. Nevertheless, the story ends in a, on a spring morning. And again, we're anticipating rebirth and renewal. The mother talks about how she's suffocated by joyful notes that are put underneath the door. Um, the idea that the family is hopeful if she engages in any of the traditional activities associated with wife and mother, that she's returning back to them. And again, what she sees is that this is just additional pressure to continue the role of wife and mother um, in absence of being able to fulfill herself. Um, which is why on page 42 of the text that I had ordered for us, she went to the cupboard and took what was hers. And then, of course, we know that she completes this laundry list, in effect, of chores. In other words, she fulfills all of the expectations of cooking and sewing and so forth, in some ways preparing the family for her absence because she does care about the family and, and she does want them to be taken care of. But it also illustrates that she's capable of engaging in all of these activities, but she just doesn't want to. Or if she does it, it literally kills her as well as figuratively kills her. So if we've ever muttered at one point, this job is going to kill me, we don't usually mean that literally, but that's, that's exactly what happens. The author is suggesting that there are many women who may not necessarily be literally dead, but are dead inside because of the roles and expectations of wife and mother. And again, the child saying she's tired from doing all our things again. Not that the child should have an understanding. The child is too young. We're introduced to the child at the beginning and the husband as if they are supposed to be um, images of perfection. But again, that's unrealistic. There is no perfection in life. Um, so despite what we read in A Secret Sorrow, that as long as you have children, then they are completely fulfilling and, and completely um, loving. Um, the child who is a tender golden three, even though might appear to be perfection at the beginning of this story, anybody who's had a three-year-old knows that they can also be quite challenging. Um, and then the husband is checking for the vitals and the, the boy is concerned with supper. Wait, can we have the turkey for supper? He wants caretaking. And again, he should at his age. Um, if you weren't quite sure how to proceed with this particular text, Many of the texts, including this text, happen to have questions at the ending of the text that could help direct your um, reading and can help direct your thinking. And on page 43, at least of the text that I had ordered, what you will see are some questions for you to consider. And these questions are in relation to a secret sorrow as well as a sorrowful woman because both these pieces are paired together. So the idea of how did you respond to the two and why? Which did you think was more complex and why? Or how do the women's attitudes towards family life differ in both of the short stories we read, A Secret Sorrow and A Sorrowful Woman? How is the woman's problems in A Sorrowful Woman, how are they made more complex than in A Secret Sorrow? And I had indicated that the problem of infertility can be quite complex. But the difficulty is that it's resolved so quickly, it's unrealistic in the portrayal that we read for A Secret Sorrow. And there is a happy resolution. And 
oftentimes in life, there isn't a completely happy resolution. It's much more complex than that. What are the themes or the central points in each of the stories? And certainly in A Secret Sorrow, the idea is that family brings complete and total fulfillment. In A Sorrowful Woman, it's the exact opposite. Family does not necessarily bring complete and total fulfillment. And both of these stories are in relation to fulfillment for female. To what extent might A Sorrowful Woman be regarded as an unromantic sequel to A Secret Sorrow? In other words, what happens to the fairy tale after the, they lived happily ever after? Can both stories be read a second or a third time and still be interesting? And I would suggest again that once you've read the first, A Secret Sorrow, there really isn't any need to read again. Um, and once you read A Sorrowful Woman, there is indeed a need to read multiple times. How do you think a romance writer would have ended A Sorrowful Woman? Well, certainly we would have had a happy ending. Um, and everybody would have been content. And again, I don't know how realistic that is, that the world has happy endings where there is complete contentness. Uh, discuss or contrast what marriage means in both stories. Um, and I, I've been sort of alluding to that. Or discuss your feelings about the sorrowful woman. How does she re remain a sympathetic character in spite of her refusal to be traditional wife and mother? And we're told it might take more than one reading of the story to see that Godwin sympathizes with her. Again, you may not sympathize with her, and that's perfectly fine, but we want to be able to identify that the author sympathizes with her. And that the epigraph, so we're given a term here that I had shared with you in a previous class of the story in A, in a Sorrowful Woman, Once Upon a Time, suggests a fairy tale ending, but the story is clearly a fairy tale gone wrong. And critical strategies, what they suggest is, even though you could utilize many critical strategies, the feminist perspective, the idea of talking about the role of gender, specifically female, in terms of interpreting a sorrowful woman. So those are just a few of the things that I wanted to highlight to you in terms of a sorrowful woman. And I had assigned two other stories for today. What I'm going to do is just to briefly discuss both, and then I will revisit them next class so that hopefully we can all be on the same page, as tiny as we are as a class, but that we can all be on the same page next week. One of the stories was entitled The Story of an Hour, and it was in the early set of readings that I had assigned because I wanted to focus on the idea of how one could annotate a text. This is on page 17, if you are using the text that I had ordered for class. And what you can see is that someone has gone through and they have put notes in the margins. It's one of the reasons why you have those wide margins in books that you oftentimes pay too much money for. Um, you're paying for all of that white space, that paper, um, so that you have a place to put notes um, that are directly connected to the um, thing that you're commenting on. And you can see that the, the notes are pretty open-ended. You can comment on things like what you think the significance of the title is or um, questions that you might have as you're reading or observations that you might make, such as the significance of a name like Mrs. Mallard, which is what we are going to be talking about. And on page 18, I think even more importantly, it talks about reader influences and about the idea about how we might be influenced in our reading by things like, well, our background. And that all of that needs to be taken into account. It isn't just an objective discipline. And that finding the main character, Mrs. Mallard, a sympathetic character, some readers say she is, others say she's not. And... Is it possible to hold both views exclusively? And is your view influenced by your being male or female? And does your age affect your perception? This one's particularly interesting because our ages are constantly changing. What about your social and economic status? Does that influence your perspective? Does your nationality, race, or religion in any way shape your attitudes? Do you have particular views about the institution of marriage that influence your feelings towards Mrs. Mallard's character? And have other reading experiences, perhaps a familiarity with the author's other works, predisposed you one way or another to Mrs. Mallard? 
So I can tell you, for instance, that in The Story of an Hour by Kate Chopin, that I am familiar with another Kate Chopin work, well, several, but probably the most important and influential was a novella known as The Awakening. A novella being something longer than a short story, but shorter than a novel. And that work, as well as most of Kate Chopin's works, happen to be about female and unfulfilled relationship. This particular work, The Awakening, was a woman's awakening, not just in terms of her, her psychological and, and intellectual status, but also her physical status. This is a sexual awakening. And it was considered to be so scandalous at the time, this would be in the 1800s, that it really led to the ending of Kate Chopin's career. She was blacklisted after that. It's a story of a woman who is married with children. She ends up leaving her husband and children to set up a residence of her own and then takes up an extramarital affair, feels guilty, not because she is cheating on her husband, but because there is yet somebody else that she would like to have an affair with. And then ultimately it ends with her committing suicide. If you note some parallels with the story we just read, a sorrowful woman, that's probably no mistake because the story of an hour is a very famous piece of literature in the canon. Those works that are studied by scholars and critics that are thought to be worth academic investigation. So I wouldn't at all be surprised that Gail Godwin, who has a PhD in English, would be well familiar with the story, the story of an hour written in the 1800s. And that a sorrowful woman is her update of that story. Um, based on the way things have changed and have not changed up until the point where she wrote her story in 1971. But it always strikes me that even though the story of an hour is written in 1894, how many similarities exist um, even though many things have changed. So thinking about things such as I've suggested, the date, the author, the title, um, things like names, uh, plot, tone, theme will serve you well for that story as well as for the other story that I had assigned for today, Rose for Emily. And one of the reasons why I assigned that particular story, in addition to it being canonical as well, is because there is a brief interview by the author afterwards, William Faulkner, where he talks a little bit about his thinking about the story. And I, I wanted to use that to illustrate that the author might have one position, but yet we as reader can equally have another position and both can be valid as long as there's elements in the text to support those positions. And again, I would consider thinking about things like the day and the author. It's a very different kind of story. It's written in a style known as Southern Gothic. So next class, we're going to talk a little bit about the Gothic tradition and what the Southern Gothic is. It's meant to be pretty dark and macabre, and it is, with a twist ending. We'll talk a little bit about what the twist ending is in Rose for Emily and why it may not be um, so obvious what the twist ending will be, what techniques Faulkner used to try to hide that twist ending from us so that we could be surprised. And you can see that in the notes below, I've included what I will be talking about next class. It's what I had hoped to talk about this class. But as I said, I, I wanted to slow down a little bit so that at the very least, if it does turn out that we have a class of just two students, that you're all in the same place. And one of the things we'll also talk about with The Rose for Emily is how it can be viewed from a symbolic perspective, that it's not just representing one person's story, but it's also an examination of a societal conflict that exists. So I think what I'm going to do is end it here. And for today's attendance question, I'm going to ask the same attendance question I normally would have, even though I didn't really talk much about uh, Story of an Hour and Rose for Emily, though I'm expecting, I'm expecting that you have read it. Um, the attendance question is, which one did you prefer, The Story of an Hour or Rose for Emily, and why? So again, there's no right or wrong answer. I'm more interested in your thinking than I am in the answer. Of course, your answer is going to depend on your having read both of the stories. You should keep up with the course outline that I have structured for this class, even though I'm slowing down a little bit because eventually we will catch up.
You're not required to respond to your classmates in the class discussion forum section, but I encourage you to do so, especially because we're such a small class. But you can think of it almost like class discussion. If we were meeting live, that you could make the uh, decision to either participate or not participate in class. But I will be responding to all of your uh, responses. And I know that our late ad needs to catch up with the with the discussion form. So please go back and, and reread those responses next week. So I hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. We will continue on next class talking about um, the story of an hour or Rose for Emily, as well as moving forward with the additional short stories. Take care. Bye-bye.